Good afternoon. I'm Nathan Schimmick, Vice President of Client Solutions at New Context. We are a San Francisco-based systems integrator that specializes in the container implementations. I'm joined today by Dinesh Israni, a senior software engineer at Portworks. And today, we're here to talk to you about what building multiple scalable DCOS deployments has taught us about running staple services on DCOS. I'd like to take a moment and thank the Linux Foundation for hosting the conference, Mesosphere for developing a great product for us to build on top of, sponsors and all of you for showing up at uh, 5 o'clock on a Friday. So without uh, further ado, let's uh, dive right in. The containerization spa space as it exists today has a myriad of challenges. Um, for a start, it's relatively new. So the teams that are today being tasked to build and maintain platforms often just don't have a huge amount of experience. Uh, similar to the you know, adoption of cloud technologies, uh, there's a, a real ramp that comes into learning and successfully building all of these things. As such, sufficient skills um, and experience are one of the things that you should really look for uh, as you go forward. Um, there are areas where traditional skills uh, don't necessarily directly translate but need to be built upon. For example, in the networking arena, you know, the recent addition of CNI, SDN, network overlays, etc., cetera, um, further complicate an already complex picture. So if it's your expectation that you're going to go from zero to production with a small team in a couple months that doesn't have uh, domain experience, it's probably going to be pretty challenging. Uh, that said, there is hope. Things are improving very rapidly. And the patterns for success in the space are quickly emerging, and the community is uh, doing a lot to bring those forward. So today, we'll talk about four high-level areas and then dive a little bit deeper. Um, first, we'll look at platform availability overall and some of the key design decisions you should be thinking about to ensure your DCOS implementation is resilient its failure. Next, we will look at some of the stickier points we both experienced within and outside the cluster. And finally, we'll review how organizations respond to these challenges and what has enabled uh, them to find success for sta running stateful services in DCOS. So let's take a look at platform availability. You'll see that there's a huge list of things that can be uh, considered failure domains. Don't consider these specific to containerization or DCOS by any means. These are failure domains that you've probably seen in Amazon environment, uh, maybe your virtualized infrastructure, and certainly could be possible in your bare metal infrastructure. In our experience, these are scenarios that given sufficient time and number of users, you're likely to uh, see at some point in your environment. So failures happen all the time. It's about how we design around those and to mitigate those risks that matter. At the end of the day, it's our job to mitigate the impact of these outages and be able to um, So when we get things wrong, and we do get things wrong, it can be dangerous and costly. That said, don't lose hope. Uh, these are certainly not insurmountable challenges. It's uh, been something that we've really focused on over the last couple of years and improving in this space. Um, when you do have an issue, get in the habit of holding a blameless postmortem, and be sure to include how one could have identified a service interruption through monitoring your metrics, and uh, be include that as part of your discussion. Then actually test, or set up and test, the appropriate monitors uh, and ensure that they behave expe as expected. If you're unfamiliar with the concept of blameless postmortems, let's have a quick conversation after this. Actually diving into how to build a resilient platform we're of the opinion that you should uh, design for production quality from the start. That doesn't mean that you have to build a production level implementation during your POC days, but keeping that uh, goal post further down is going to be really important. It's our experience that the difference in effort uh, is comparatively small when you look at the challenges companies face when a POC implementation gets traction and suddenly you're hosting revenue generating systems on top of um, unstable or potentially just small scale infrastructure. Uh, invariably, when that happens, platform stability issues emerge, uh, as the top one is just platform is just being asked to do things it's not really designed to do, and users have bad experiences. Um, additionally, when you design from the start with production scale infrastructure in mind, you inform decisions that you'll make at a later time as you have a specific lens to, to work with. Your automation and tool choices are very heavily impacted by the design, and over the medium term, you should actually be able to get further ahead as your investment in automation from the start around the ability to build and rebuild clusters easily with minimal impact, 
uh, will greatly reduce your time and upgrade and allow you to rapidly iterate on your DCOS infrastructure. It's, our, again, our experience that on small-scale implementations, you can experience more time, time with cluster rebuilds than a much larger one due to the typical approach of manual intervention in a POC environment and small-scale environment versus a heavy focus on automation when you go to scale. Some key points to think about uh, from your automation efforts. Are your, op are your operators safe to terminate at least one node without any measurable impact? Yes, that's great. What happens if three nodes go down? What if you answered no to that? What happens when you lose a node and you're sitting at a talk at MesosCon at 17.06 on a Friday? Well, did your monitoring and metrics collection pick it up and automatically resolve that and just uh, open up a ticket to let you know something happened? Or did a developer who's relying upon services provided on top of DCOS have to open a ticket internally? Or even worse yet, some end user wait 25 minutes, experiencing an outage, open up a ticket with your company, and then you, know, you have SLA impacts. All of these things can, by and large, be mitigated with the proper design and implementation from the start. Continuing down that scenario, so now we've got some nodes down. A customer has called in, and after 25, or so, uh, a customer has called in after 25 minutes. You've been paged out, and now you've got to open up your laptop, connect remotely, and take a look at what's going on. Do you have the ability to bring back the failed nodes with a single command, easily executed, or do you have to actually dig in and do some manual intervention? Again, now we're adding time. All these things are relatively easily addressed, especially if that skill set's required to uh, really take on a, the challenges associated with containers um, and stateful services within them. Now I'll hand it over to Dinesh to talk about uh, stateful s services on storage. Thanks, Nate. So uh, in this new age of DevOps worlds, uh, typically everything needs to be automated. Uh, because no one's really got the time to log in and manually recover from failures. Um, also, this is not really uh, possible at large scale because you don't want uh, one of your DevOps folks to basically be up at, like Nate said, at 5 p.m. On a, on, a, on a Friday to basically try to bring up 1,000 nodes that went down and, and try to recover your data. Uh, you want to make sure that the storage solution you choose has good integration with schedulers. And if you're using multiple schedulers, you want to make sure that they work they work across multiple schedulers, so you don't need to use multiple solutions with them. Um, for example, you also want to make sure that you are able to efficiently schedule pods uh, to be co-located with your data uh, so that you get good performance for your uh, pods or containers. Um, and uh, don't spend a lot of uh, network bandwidth just uh, doing data, uh, just sending data across your nodes. Uh, on a large scale, you also don't want to manually provision volumes every time a customer, whether it's internal or external, needs to spin up new services, because that is just adding another layer of manual intervention, which is just not acceptable in this uh, day, day of automation. So uh, w one of the things is you also want to make sure that you test various failure scenarios and uh, how schedulers deal with them uh, with regards to storage in, in order to avoid uh, nasty surprises in production. So we at Portworks are actually working towards an open source framework called Torpedo, which will help you validate these var uh, various failure scenarios to avoid just that. Uh, the next thing that you should look at is uh, how easy you are able to basically add or replace storage nodes and perform maintenance operations. Because these are the kind of operations that could basically result in downtime for your services. So you want to make sure that any storage solution that you choose minimizes or eliminates these kind of downtime. Um, so for example, if you're using auto scaling groups with Amazon, uh, you, you need to figure out how that would affect you. Uh, would the storage from your old nodes automatically be available to your new nodes? Um, and if you wanted to add capa capacity to your storage solution, are you able to scale up your current nodes, or would you uh, basically uh, be able to add new nodes to scale up your cluster either? Uh, another thing to keep in mind is uh, how your services would work in hybrid cloud deployments, uh, because uh, you don't want to be building tools and automation across uh, for different types of environments that you have. You want to have one way of doing things across multiple environments. Uh, so for that, you basically, be, uh, you basically want to use a cloud-native storage solution like Portworks uh, to make sure that it is easy to, uh, easy to manage and deploy your storage in one way. 
uh, you don't have to have multiple automation frameworks and uh, tools to manage uh, different uh, deployments uh, in that way, like uh, Nathan pointed out. Um, also, you, uh, you want to aim for highly available data, as Nathan pointed out earlier, because you don't want to run into production and then figure out that, oh, you lost a node, and then you're not able to bring, that, uh, bring the same services up because you failed to replicate your data. Um, another thing that you want to make sure is that your storage solution is automatically uh, able to place replicas across failure domains so that you're always able to bring up your service even if an entire rack goes down. So this would actually require your storage solution to be intelligent enough to figure out where they are located and uh, automatically place data on uh, in different uh, availability zones when they are provisioned. Finally, you want to make sure that when the time does come to upgrade your software solution, you don't have to bring down your entire cluster. You want to make sure that there is a way to perform in place rolling upgrades to minimize uh, disruptions. Again, this sometimes requires integrations with schedulers to let them know that uh, your storage is going to be down on, uh, on a particular node, so that it should not schedule uh, any containers onto that node while the upgrade is in process. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to Nathan now to talk about uh, the test for the fail failure scenarios that uh, I alluded to. Great. Thanks, Dinesh. Testing is key in our world. Today, there are a number of companies, like Portworks with Torpedo and Netflix with Chaos Monkey, that are building and open sourcing tools which allow you to simulate real-world outages for various services. Um, ideally, you would eventually mature that to actually running in your production environment. But on the path there, I would suggest building a production-like environment, so a minimal scale implementation that follows the same clustering topology, network topology, et cetera, as your actual production infrastructure, and run it there. Doing so will likely expose gaps in monitoring, responsing, or response times, uh, any number of areas that uh, you are going to hit in production. This will just be a less costly way to find it and, and patch that up. Um, so again, Develop metrics and monitoring that align to the failure scenarios that you see most commonly and are most impactful. Uh, in the world today, it's incredibly easy to implement a tool, check a bunch of checkboxes, and just get totally inundated with uh, the data that's delivered to you, and it becomes unactionable. Really focus on what impacts you and how to respond to that. Additionally, when things break, and they will, uh, it's really important to limit the blast radius. The last thing you want to have happen is a cascading failure, which takes significant downtime and effort to recover from. Um, if we started with a HA design and implementation, have focused on automation, we've already taken significant steps to reduce the impact of uh, single zone outages. And we can further contain the likelihood of that happening by isolating user applications from each other, platform services from users, and platform services from each other. For example, if a platform service needs Zookeeper, then the Zookeeper instance of the service it, that is linked to should not be accessible from the platform users. Isolating platform services from the user space will help ensure platform resiliency in the face of application issues. Additionally, sandboxing platform services will help avoid everything from noisy neighbor problems and resource consumption issues to cascading failures. At the end of the day, infrastructure is multidisciplinary and cross-functional, and DCUS is no different. You really need expertise in security, compliance, containers specifically, compute, storage, networking, automation, CI, on and on and on. We're not yet to the point where we've fully converged those skill sets, so find people with experience in that space and bring them in. The, the days of having a compute team and a network team and a storage team don't really align with the model of DCUS, and nor do they align in really modern operation models in general. Uh, DevOps is pretty fundamentally changed the space, and you should look to a, a lot of the learnings from there. So now let's take a look at what's happening within the cluster. With that, I'll hand it back to Dinesh. So uh, once you have your cluster up and running, uh, you will realize that your needs, needs will change over time, either uh, because the apps that you use will change, the scale that you run them at will change, or it's just the ever-evolving tech that you're involved with. So in such scenarios, you don't want to tear down your volumes or cluster and reinstall everything to be able to deal with your new requirements. For example, if you provisioned a uh, 100 GB volume with your, for your application, but uh, the demand and use for that application far exceeded your expectation, 
and you now need to allocate more space to it. Do you want to provision another volume and move data over from the old uh, volume? Uh, you, you, you don't. The ideal way uh, you would want to do this is uh, do it in real time without uh, having any downtime for your services. And you will eventually hit a point where you will uh, need to add more storage to your uh, storage solution. Again, you would want to make sure that the solution that you have chosen allows you to do this seamlessly by either adding disks to nodes or adding new nodes, as I had mentioned earlier. Uh, you also want to make sure that you understand your customers' needs with regards to backups and uh, archiving data. For example, you want to set up schedules to take regular snapshots automatically and also archive your data outside your cluster in terms of, uh, in cases of disaster, so that you can basically recover uh, from that. Uh, so for example, with Portworks, you can do this by setting up snapshots scheduled at a container granular level, uh, and also take cloud snaps, which can back up your data to either S3, Azure Blob, or uh, Google Cloud Storage. So in a case of disaster, all you would need to do is basically restore from that cloud snap and reconfigure your apps, and you would be up and running with your service. Uh, you also need to understand your security needs based on the service uh, you are running. Uh, for example, how is your data stored on REST as well as um, in transit? Uh, depending on the industry you are in, there might be regulations, uh, and you want to make sure that you can enable encryption, encryption for both these cases. Um, lastly, you also want to make sure that you can monitor the health of your storage solution and receive alerts in case of pending doom so that you can proactively take measures to avoid downtime. Um, and today with uh, tools like Prometheus and Grafana, there is really no, ex no excuse for storage solutions not to provide such integrations. Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to Nathan to talk about some of the platform security stuff uh, that you can talk about. Security within the containerization realm and security in general is a much broader and deeper topic than we'll have time to really go into today. But I figure we'd just do a couple quick hits. Platforms or patterns for both attacking and defending containers are evolving rapidly. There are several open source software initiatives uh, creating patterns to attempt to address this space, though the bulk of the progress really has been made in the enterprise uh, software realm. There are a few things that you, that you can do today, probably with relatively low cost, uh, by either deploying new tools or tweaking existing tools uh, to take advantage of some of the security improvements. Um, we're probably, most people here are probably aware of the CIS Docker benchmark. I think it provides value. It's one of the things that we integrate as part of CI on a very, very regular basis. Additionally, you can look at container image signing, build time vulnerability scanning, and compliance control uh, enforcement and monitoring through something like NSPEC and test-driven development. Again, I'm happy to talk about all these things over beers afterwards, but each one of these things warrants a probably a multi-day track, so we'll just skip through that a little bit quickly. Now to the fun part really operationalizing things. Um, at the end of the day, you will always need to maintain what you build. And maintenance is in, uh, encompasses you know, version to version upgrades, major upgrades, accommodating, breaking changes, etc. Cluster maintenance and upgrades have become significantly easier in the DCS world. If, uh, you've, if you've been using it for you know, 18 months or more, uh, you know this. And based off of my kind of rough understanding of the product roadmap for DCOS, there are some significant improvements in uh, 1.11. I'm sure that the people out at the Mesosphere booth uh, would be happy to run you through the product roadmap on that front. Even with good controls and training, users will still find a way to break things, lock up resources, and otherwise just cause havoc in the, in the cluster. You know, occasional jo frozen jobs, runaway apps, and orphan tasks just happen. It's the name of the game. Um, planning ahead for these issues will really uh, make your life much easier. Now let's take a look at how we handle some of the challenges with externalizing services which are uh, built and running in DCOS. As I kind of alluded to earlier, networking is one of the more tricky areas uh, given the additional complexities added by network overlays, CNI, SDN, et cetera. Um, clusters today are really well designed for internal traffic. Apps talking to apps within the cluster is uh, highly reliable, well understood, and overall pretty trivial. The real challenges in our experience come from when you need to wire in to existing infrastructure and externalize a service. For example, do you have an IPAM tool in place today in your company? Does it provide an API that is both uh, 
is easy to automate against? If not, do you have to adopt a new tool for your company to do IP address management? Or do you carve out some subset just for your containerization environment? Start to add, st when you start to add in things like IP per container, this conversation becomes much more complex. So in this realm, as well as with service discovery and load balancing, what you have in place today is l going to uh, largely inform what you do with your DCUS implementation. Um, you know, I'm sure we all have opinions on what you would want to do in a brown or a greenfield environment uh, when it comes to load balancing, uh, service discovery, et cetera. Um, it's my experience that I haven't been particularly lucky as a consultant and the ability to just, uh, start from a greenfield. Uh, if you have those projects going, that's really cool. I'd love to talk to you about those and uh, hear what your thoughts are. Um, but again, for me, uh, the name of the game here is really how do we integrate into existing environments and then move stateful services uh, that are today running on either bare metal or in a virtualized environment uh, into containers. So last but certainly not least, let's talk about organizational. Um, as I've alluded to, uh, I actually believe that this is kind of the, the chief metric on whether or not you're going to be successful in your DCOS implementation, and I would say uh, containerization in general. The team who leads the internal container initiative really will define its success, or lack thereof. Um, they, it's our experience that they need to bring themselves, their peers, the inter and the internal developer community up to speed on all of these new technologies, patterns, et cetera, um, pretty much in parallel, and that's a pretty difficult task. As such, one of the ways to kind of ease the burden here is to engage people early, probably your developer community first off, and really get to understand what their requirements are. Um, at the end of the day, you're building a platform for services, and if you're not providing services which are consumable or of interest to the people building software on top of that, what are you doing it for? Uh, so I'm, I'm a strong proponent of kind of thinking of this as a software project more so than a traditional infrastructure project. Uh, I always handle this in an agile fashion, do some requirements gathering, work very rapidly and iteratively to provide value as quickly as possible. That way, assuming they have a good experience, assuming the platform's available and resilient and provide services that people are interested in, they're typically to use it. And then once you have adoption, hopefully you can turn those people into evangelists to turn other people into your community on to the platform you're now providing. Um, it's uh, too often I certainly see a small scale implementation that doesn't really look at what they're trying to service and they don't get adoption and wonder why. Um, you know, it's not one of those things that if you build it, they will come. It's if you make it easy to use and attractive, they might use it. Uh, but certainly if you just make it difficult to use or are not providing any value, they're not going to uh, engage with you. As Dinesh touched on, there are a number of guardrails that do need to be built, especially when it comes to reasoning about data services, um, guardrails in general. At the end of the day, there are data sovereignty laws, which can be as granular as a local level, but certainly at a state and national level exist. Um, as Dinesh pointed out, that can be something as, as simple as encryption, or if you're in a you know, multi-region implementation, and accidentally decide or purposefully decide to replicate uh, personally identifiable information, for example, out of the European Union to the United States or vice versa, uh, you have now really gone off the rails and your internal controls and compliance organization is not going to be happy with you. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of trivially easy to do that from a technology perspective and it can have huge ramifications on uh, your company from a legal perspective. That's not, not a great conversation anyone wants to have with uh, your CIO or your internal legal uh, general counsel. So look at an internal controls on how, engage with your internal controls group to see what you can do, what you should be doing. Um, additionally, be mindful of any in industry specific controls, right? In the United States, we have HIPAA for healthcare, uh, we have SOC and a number of things, and they, they reason about what we need to do, what our responsibilities are, and regardless of the platform that we're delivering our services upon, it is our responsibility to do that. So at the end of the day, have some conversations, stay in compliance, make everybody's lives easier. Um, on the skill set area, there are some ways to just engender growth and adoption, right? Uh, first and foremost, hopefully, if, even if you have to do some external recruiting, find some experienced engineers who have you know, run through this or worked in the platform. They will be a great asset to you. If you don't have that, 
not a problem. There's a wide community, right? There's Slack channels and GitHub and a million places, conferences like you're at now, to really find people engage with and learn from them. Additionally, especially early on, I'm a big fan of creating an operational playground, both for the platform engineering side as well as the developer side. Um, it's my experience that I need to be able to figure out how to break a cl cluster, break clusters unintentionally, uh, rapidly iterate on automation to rebuild things. And if I'm doing that while developers are attempting to learn how to use the platform, I'm negatively impacting their experience. So if you have uh, enough compute resources available, just give yourself your own playground, give dev their own playground, and eventually you can probably get to the point where you're mature enough that you can consolidate those things. But off the break, I would definitely start there. Additionally, just general uh, Notes from Agile, right? Fail fast and fail often. It's totally okay, right? We, this is a learning experience for many of us. Um, and finally, uh, if you want to make this more attractive and you know drive some internal adoption, set up a hack day. Figure out what uh, what makes sense. What problems are you trying to face? So now you have um, a great way to help on or a great way to help on all these fronts is to focus on training. Uh, after you've found some internal advocates and evangelists who are familiar and can drive uh, excitement within your organization. Um, and once you have a base level of engagement, coupled with providing developers and, in developers and engineers with environments where they can learn, you should be able to rapidly iterate an experiment to drive adoption. Around somewhere in this point, I would suggest investing in formalized training and then use that experience of formalized training to build training that actually matters to you. Um, at the end of the day, stateful services uh, is a very expanding field. So what makes sense for a company looking at implementing Cassandra versus something else might not be the same. Really find, find what the, how to bring up the skill sets that are applicable to your organization. Um, at the end of the day, uh, running stateful services and containers is not trivial. DCOS and Portworx are making it significantly easier, but it still requires expertise in a wide range of areas to successfully do that. And finding experienced advocates and evangelists in your organization will really help. Um, so by pulling all these things together, uh, you should find that you're fostering the right skills to make your platform attractive and available, and eventually, or hopefully soon, getting to production level services. So with that, we're pretty much done. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much.